from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Elon Musk unloads $5 billion worth of Tesla shares as the billionaire tax debate continues to rev up. And he plans to sell them long before his Twitter poll, apparently. We'll talk about what that really means. Plus, Bumble shares falling to their lowest level since going public after a drop in subscribers at its European dating app, Adu. We'll talk to CEO Whitney Wolf Hurd about the future of dating in a post-COVID world. And Alibaba's record-breaking singles day, the shopping festival raking in more than $84 billion in sales. How this impacts chi the Chinese tech giant after a year of increased scrutiny from Beijing. We will get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets. U.S. stocks pulling back from rebounds, Tesla fluctuating on the back of Musk's share sales, and Disney slumping on the back of earnings. Our Shanali Basik has the full picture. Shanali, take it away. Yeah, hi, Emily. You do have the S&P jumping back a little higher today. It wasn't a big rise, but it is after two days of decline. And guess what? More than that, you have the NASDAQ rising higher than the S&P and the Russell 2000 rising even higher than that. So you do have a pretty broad-based rise here. You had volatility lessening on the day, but obviously that volatility has not been enough to deter some of the risk-taking we've seen. We have the Galaxy Galaxy Crypto Index, the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, a little bit lower today. But as we know, it was very recently we had crypto hitting a record high. When we look at that Russell 2000, like I was talking about, 3,000 members that we were talking about, we have a broad-based rally here. Finally, a bid being caught in small cap stocks. People worried about valuation among the bigger companies a little bit. You have companies, um, more of them moving above their moving average, their 200-day moving average. And if you take a look as well, let's look at the uh, the tech subsectors here because we do have as uh, well of a rally in many of those sectors, though not as broad based as you are seeing over in the Russell 2000, the smaller stocks like I was talking about. You have uh, the SOX up 1.9 percent, the biotech index, like I was saying, down a little bit on the day. The Golden Dragon China index up 5 percent. That's the biggest of the group over there. And the electric vehicle makers up 1.6 percent, though that is nothing when you look over at at something like Rivian that was up 20% for a second day. All right, Shanali, thank you so much for the roundup. Meantime, Elon Musk barking heated debate over the weekend when he asked his Twitter followers whether he should shell a big chunk of his Tesla stake. Come Wednesday, he unloads $5 billion worth of Tesla shares, but it turns out he may have planned that sale months ago. Let's bring in our Ed Ludlow. So Ed, the Form 4 comes in and we right. are digging through it. You are yep. digging through it, trying to do the math. What exactly did he sell and why? So the headline is $5 billion worth of shares, four and a half million over the course shares over the course of three days, but they're not all the same. So about a billion dollars worth were tied to tax obligations that Elon Musk had on options. You know, in 2012, he was granted options as part of his compensation. Those expired next August. So he exercised the options and he owed tax on that. So what did he do? He sold enough shares, 934,000, to meet those tax obligations. Now, that leaves 3.9 million shares and about $4 billion of other stock. There was nothing in the filings about whether he planned this in September like he did with the options one. There was nothing about it being tied to tax obligations. He just sold the remainder of stock. Okay, so at least some of this share sale was planned. Some of it, right. right. Then what does that Twitter poll actually mean? Is it misleading? Well, when he tweeted that, he knew that he had arranged this payment schedule based on exercising those options and selling stock to meet the tax obligations. He filed that on September the 14th. So that's months. We have no idea about the remainder. Almost $4 billion worth of stock that he sold Tuesday, Wednesday at a really elevated price. Obviously, the shares had an incredible run up of late, although it dropped off following that tweet. Right. We don't know the cycle. And of course, he could still sell 10% of his stake, yeah. like Twitter seems to want him to. Right, if you're, a, if you're an investor in Tesla, how often has Elon Musk tweeted in a way that moves the stock. I think we, you know, we have great examples of that, right? You go back to the tweet, August 2018, funding secured. The tweet. Incredible. And, and the, the shares jump 11%. He is then reprimanded by the SEC over that. 
you know, even as recently as November 1st when the Hertz chaos was going on, there's this deal, Bloomberg reports a deal of Hertz, Hertz says they've received Teslas, and yet he tweets no contract with Hertz. The stock moves, you know. <laughs> He's also tweeted that he thinks Tesla's stock is too high. Right. Valued too highly. Right, and it's unusual behavior for a CEO. But remember, that what all this comes back to is not about Tesla's valuation, according to the Twitter poll. It was about tax. It's also about this debate, right, that billionaires aren't paying enough right. or using tax havens or somehow avoiding taxes. Is he trying to buff, buffer his image here, or does he actually want a real answer? Clearly, clearly he's thinking about this. You know, I was at Code Conference where this was put to him, and he said, whoa, I do pay tax. You know, there's a ProPublica report that he didn't pay tax, right? He says that he pays an effective rate of 53% tax, but he doesn't take a salary from Tesla or SpaceX. The only way he can pay tax is through his stock and options. And so he says, hold on, you guys want me to pay tax. The only way I can do that is to sell the stock. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll keep watching his Twitter as we do. No, oh, yeah. So much fun. Bloomberg said, love, love. Thank you. Meantime, Disney is trying to ramp up excitement for its Disney Plus Day coming up this Friday with some new promotions for subscribers. This after the streaming service added a disappointing 2 million subs, a far cry from last quarter when nearly 13 million users signed up. This while rival Netflix is expecting almost double digits next quarter thanks to original hits like Squid Game. For more, I'm joined by Rich Greenfield, partner at Lightshed Ventures. So, Rich, what do these new numbers tell you? Are they perhaps maxed out? on new subscribers, especially in the United States. You know, Emily, it's just sort of sad, right? I mean, at the end of the day, Disney's got some of the world's best content and they have all the ability to effectively win if they want to win. But like many legacy media companies, they're dealing with the balance and they're conflicted. Do we support our legacy TV businesses? Do we support the movie theater business that we've been in for years and de decades, I should say? You know, if Disney wanted to have Shang-Chi, Eternals, all of these movies, West Side Story, only available on Disney Plus, they'd have an incredible slate of content in Q4 for Disney Plus. Instead, you turn on Disney Plus, top title is The Simpsons, Mickey Mouse Club, Bluey, Moana. Like, it's just, honestly, it's just embarrassing how bad the kind of headline content, there's nothing for anyone over the age of 10 in terms of fresh content. And they keep saying it's coming, it's coming. They have an incredible array of content for adults. I mean, The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, Dancing with the Stars, all of this content could be Disney Plus exclusives and they could have a really comprehensive service hmm. that could be driving subscribers at far higher prices. Instead, they're stuck in their silos and they're trying to balance all of their legacy businesses with Disney Plus and balancing this whole dabbling balancing they're losing. They're just not winning the way they could. They have all of the resources, and I think it's just disappointing that Chapik is sort of waiting and waiting versus using the resources he has at his disposal right now to, to accelerate growth. Meantime, Rich, I'm just noticing that you're wearing a Squid Game t-shirt, which there, of course is there we Netflix's go. big original hit. You told me when Disney Plus debuted that it would never be as big as Netflix. Do you still believe that? You know, when you have a service, first of all, I should say, the one thing we didn't count on when Disney Plus launched is that they'd give it away to 40 plus million homes in Asia. So, you know, when you say as big as the subscriber numbers, it's roughly half the subscriber base, but it's very misleading because, you know, basically more than a third of that, or almost a third of that sub base, they're effectively giving away in Asia as part of Hotstar. But if you look at revenues, I think that's probably the better way of thinking about your question these things aren't even close. I mean, if you look at some recent Comscore data, just to give you a sense of, of viewership, on connected TVs in the US, Netflix is 26% of time spent, YouTube is 21, Disney plus 4%, and it's been declining. Like there just mm -hmm. is not that much to watch, and that's why people are paying ARPU $6 or less in the US, $4 globally. It's a very, very, low cost service with very little usage. That's the disturbing thing is that they could drive it. You know, no, no one sits, in, I think the best way of thinking about this, Emily, Coco Melon is a top 10 title. It's for preschool kids, Moonbug Entertainment, uh, recently acquired by Kevin Mayer and Blackstone and Tom Staggs. That show sits on Netflix 
right next to Squid Game. Squid Game, obviously for adults, not for young kids, but preschool and adult content sits right next to each other, yet Disney thinks they have to have different services for each type of content. You, you just had a bloody, you know, you had the bloody figure on. Like, it's just, <laughs> but it's just funny. Like, no one is complaining. No parent. You don't see an uproar of parents saying, oh, my God, I can't believe Squid Game is sitting next to Coco Melon. Disney mm -hmm. needs to realize it needs to put all of its content into one place. Forget about movie theaters. Forget about broadcast TV. Forget about cable networks. Put all of their content into one place and win. That's, and I, unfortunately, going back to your question, though, if, do I think they will be as big as Netflix? No, because they have a management team that is unwilling to do what is necessary to win. Speaking of, you don't hold back, Rich, which is why we love having you on the show. And as I understand it, you've been disinvited from Disney events. You haven't been able to ask a question on a call yeah. for a, a few years, right? I mean, what's this? Give us a status update on your relationship with Disney. You know, look, they, they, at least they invite us to listen to their conference calls and they tell us when things are happening. But, you know, look, I thought with Chapik taking over, I was hopeful that things would change because, you know, Iger and Xenia, their head of communication, certainly didn't like us. I don't know. The entire management team has turned over. I'm certainly hopeful. I would love to have the conversation. We have lots of big ideas that we think could be helpful to Disney. Um, I, I think in terms of what would make the stock go up. I mean, we've been very vocal that um, Chapik and team should be spinning off ESPN and ABC. Those are businesses that have no synergy with the rest of Disney and would create substantial value. And the shareholders we talk to do not want Disney owning ESPN and ABC. These are not businesses going in the right direction. So look, I would love to. I would love to break bread with Bob Chapik um, and his management team. We're still waiting. We would love that. Anytime, we would be there. All right. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if they get that message. Light sheds, Rich Greenfield. Keep us posted. Thanks Thank for you. having me, Emily. All right. Coming up, Bumble shares stumbling after a less than stellar third quarter results, but analysts are betting next quarter gets better. I'll talk next with the CEO of Bumble, Whitney Wolf Heard, about where she sees the dating world after COVID and even in the metaverse beyond. This is Bloomberg. With life getting ever closer to, well, some sort of normal, so is the world of dating. Bumble reporting its third quarter earnings, and while it missed Wall Street estimates, paid users for the dating app that allows women to make the first move did increase. What is the future of post-pandemic dating for those looking for love? I'm joined now by CEO and founder of Bumble, Whitney Wolf Heard. Whitney, always good to have you here on the show. Look, the stock dropped almost 20%. Today, there's concern about the miss in uh, paid subscribers and also what's happening with Badoo, a decline in users there. What is your message to investors today? Yeah, so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's just lay the groundwork for a quick second before we get into the paid user question. So we are always focused on the fundamentals and we had an excellent Q3. We expect revenue to accelerate year over year, which is why we raised our guidance for Q4 and the full year. And Bumble app is doing exceptionally well. So let's talk about the paid users for a moment. Our strategy has been to create value added experiences that our users want to pay for, that adds value to their experience. So. In the last several quarters, this has focused on creating premium experiences through our second tier on Bumble and Badoo. So this resulted in higher RP poo, average revenue per paying user, and fast revenue growth. But it's not a strategy that is focused at the moment on selling low price point consumable offerings to everyone. Thus, it results in lower uh, subscription numbers. But that said, we are very confident in our underlying business. We do not have an issue. Um, our users continue to grow. They are growing at a very rapid pace. And we have more and more opportunities to generate higher numbers of payers. This is going to be strengthened through new products that we have on the roadmap for 2022, and in addition to just our normal business practices. So that's the way we are thinking about payers. I think there's a bit of confusion Fusion in the market, which is, you know, par for the course. And then as we turn to okay. Badoo, I think it's uh, on the Badoo point, I think it's really important to note that we implemented some temporary changes in our billing and payment systems on Android that by design 
eliminated third-party payment options just very temporarily. So this also had the effect of improving our PIPU, but not growing that number of payers. But we've since reversed that, um, given some changes in the App Store environment, and we are rebounding from this as well. So look, the U.S. is fairly open now. There are still COVID challenges in Europe. What does the future of dating in a mid to post COVID world look like? What are the trends that you're seeing? So, you know, the trends are really fascinating. Throughout COVID and currently, Bumble continues to grow rapidly around the world, irrespective of the COVID environment. We have strong re-engagement in the US, very strong new user growth in markets as wide ranging as Mexico, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Germany, France, and so on. So when you think about the way Bumble has been impacted by COVID, it just really reinforces the strength of our brand, our product, and the customer base that relies on us for connection and for relationships. As we turn to Badu, I think it's really important to take a note, um, to take a moment to notice that that customer base is inherently different, right? It's a different uh, market. It's a different offering. And because of the, the countries that we're so strong in with Badu, they have just inadvertently been impacted by COVID in a more serious way. And so when you think about Badu more generally, it actually continues to be a very, very highly engaged dating app. And it's the second most downloaded app globally. It's just seeing slight, uh, you know, stronger headwinds due to COVID. But as we okay. look to the future, as these markets reopen, what's fascinating is we remain a staple in people's dating lives. We remain the go-to for uh creating relationships. People now have no time to sit around and waste when they want to find someone special or find someone to share in special moments. They turn to us to take control over their dating lives, especially women. And we are seeing this across the globe. You talked a few times on the call about the blockchain and the metaverse. How do you think these mega trends could impact the future of dating? Does What does dating in the metaverse look like? Is that an opportunity? It's absolutely an opportunity. You know, Web3 is a huge opportunity for us. We are a business rooted in connection, in building community. And as you know, we are slowly um, optimizing and rolling out the new refresh version of our platonic connection platform, BFF, which has already shown uh, remarkable uh, crossover opportunities between the dating and the platonic, but it's also just proving the strength of the demand for platonic relationships. And when you think about Web3, how we really turn our customer into members with real ownership over the product and through their experience to have these creator channels and ways to interact in, in a deeper way, you know, the pre-match experience could turn even more digital. And you saw us roll this out uh, very generally speaking with video, but the metaverse is, is a real opportunity in the future. And we expect to be uh, the, the front runners as it comes to dating and building community more broadly, um, because that's just a natural extension of who we are as a, pro as a product and as a brand. Okay, last quick question. We, we've got just about 30 seconds left, but it is Singles Day, which is obviously huge in China. And I didn't realize it's becoming a lot more popular in the United States. What do you make of that? Are you seeing any um, change in activity on the app? So every day is Singles Day uh, at our company, <laughs> but we will have to analyze how that um, impacted us today. But I will say that, you know, every single day is an opportunity for singles to come and unite and find whatever they're looking for. That's what we're here for. And to give them control and power over healthy and equitable relationships. All right, Whitney Wolfer, CEO of Bumble. Always good to have you here. Thanks for giving us a glimpse of the dating world of the future. Great to okay. see you, thanks. Good to see you. Coming up, as COP26 talks come to an end in Glasgow, we're gonna find out what is still unresolved, including crucial negotiations on international carbon markets. More on that next. And as we head to break, Spotify finishing the day up 2.5%. The streaming service expanding to audiobooks with the acquisition of Find A Way. The purchase marks Spotify's ambition to grow beyond a music app and become the default service for all kinds of audio. This is Bloomberg.
The fight against climate change requires a rethink of the way we live, the way companies conduct businesses, and the way governments design policies in every sector of the economy. Reducing emissions comes at a cost, and here is what could help reduce the burden and accelerate pollution cuts. Carbon markets. The idea is this. Countries where cutting carbon is expensive and difficult can buy credits representing emission reductions from nations that already lower their pollution more than planned. Companies can invest in projects that lower greenhouse gases in other countries too. Such projects, for example, replacing dirty sources of energy with renewables, will generate offsets, which then can be traded further. Demand is booming for offsets, as corporations and governments spend billions of dollars to meet their net zero targets. More credits have changed hands in the first eight months of this year than in all of 2020, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. While nations and some companies have relied on carbon markets for quite some time already, the quality of offsets varies. There are concerns that some of them produce hot air or fail to respect human rights. The Paris Agreement paved the way for new carbon offset programs in Article 6. There, the issuance and quality of credits will be overseen by the United Nations. A well-designed market could spur up to $1 trillion of investment in developing nations and encourage low-carbon innovation. But if the rules are too lax, it would merely give a pass to companies and governments to pollute more than they should. That was Bloomberg's Eva Krukowska reporting on the COP26 talks wrapping up in Glasgow. Now, Robin Hood is the target of a class action lawsuit in New York federal court over allegedly failing to protect millions of current and former customers' confidential information. Earlier this month, the company announced a hacker, quote, socially engineered a customer support employee by phone and obtained access to certain customer support systems. The complaint filed against Robinhood says the data breach could have been avoided through basic security measures, authentications, and training. Coming up, the future of fintech. We're going to take a look at SoFi's third quarter results and we'll see whether or not they think it paid off to be the only retail platform to offer access to Rivian's IPO. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get more on the markets with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, you were all over Rivian's big debut Wednesday. Of course, you had an exclusive interview with the CEO. How was day two? You know the expression, a picture can tell or say a thousand words. Two days of trading up almost 60% from where the stock opened, way, way above the listing price of $78 a share. We're closing at $122.99 a share on Thursday. And now we're turning to questions about valuation. Rivian has a valuation as of Thursday's close above $100 billion. This is a company which has delivered fewer than 200 battery electric pickups, most of those to employees. That is its market capitalization. There's already intense debate around Tesla's valuation above a trillion dollars and it delivering probably less than a million vehicles this year. And this is all the intense debate that's going on on Twitter among Wall Street analysts around investors sitting on the sideline and asking, is this a company we should be buying into? This is a growth company. This is a bet on its future and the markets it's moving into. Let's see where it sits among the pantheon of all time US IPOs. Astonishing really that, and you've covered some of these amazing companies over the years, Facebook was a huge IPO and yet look how close we are in terms of the money raised. So that's what the discussion is here. Is raising $12 billion for a company that's delivered hardly any vehicles going to help it justify that valuation in the long run? That's the debate. How quickly can it scale production and bring meaningful sales? And do you remember Tesla? Very quickly, Em, think back to that. When will Tesla record a profit? How long did we ask that question? How long are we going to ask that question with Rivian? Astonishing two days of debut trading. All right, Ed, thank you for that roundup. 
Meantime, strong third quarter results for the online personal finance company SoFi. Shares in the fintech firm soaring after its latest earnings report beat estimates. How did they manage it and what's next for them? Let's ask SoFi CEO Anthony Noto, who joins us now. Anthony, I want to start with Rivian because you actually uh, were the only trading platform to offer Rivian shares to retail investors. Just how big was demand? Uh, there was a lot of demand. It was obviously a very attractive IPO for investors that are looking to invest in innovation and also invest in a new platform for vehicles. Uh, obviously, on the on the EV platform, we had about three hundred million dollars of demand from our member base for the IPO, and we were able to at, you know deliver at least one share to everyone that confirmed the order and had funding. But obviously, uh, we we're well oversubscribed, like the rest of the deal. So. Uh, not everyone got 100% of their confirmed orders, but uh, everyone well, did get it. Sure. Well oversubscribed. Can you tell us how oversubscribed? Sure, uh, the demand was very strong, um, well in excess of, of the supply that we that we had. I can't get into details beyond that. Do you wish it could have gotten more? You got 0.4%. And, and, and how much did this pay off for SoFi? Uh, well, the way we think about it is we want to deliver value, a value proposition for our members where we're a one-stop shop across all the major financial uh, products that someone needs in their lives and build a lifetime relationship. Um, investing is one of those areas and having different selection within investing is important. We are, we're the only place that offers single stocks without commission, fractional shares, ETFs, robo-advisory accounts, cryptocurrency, and IPOs, and that's another piece of differentiated selection. So yes, we would love to have more supply. We clearly have the demand for it, and we want to continue to bring the best selection and most unique selection to our members so they can get their money right. We saw Coinbase and Robinhood report disappointing uh, results for at least as far as investors were concerned. Your stock, on the other hand, soaring on the back of your report. What do you think is driving that optimism? Yeah, I think a few things stick out because we are building this one-stop shop for financial services products on your mobile device. We have businesses that benefit in a low interest rate environment and then other businesses that benefit in a high interest rate environment. We also have businesses that benefit from stay at home as well as reopening. So we've been able to navigate through the volatile environment of going through those different cycles over the last two years. We had a record quarter of revenue, um, which exceeded Q2, which was a record in itself. Um, that was driven by strong performance across all three of our diverse businesses. And so the diversity that we deliver to our consumers translates into a more diverse revenue base. And there are companies that are missing because they're only in brokerage, they're only in lending, or they're only in uh, categories that benefited from stay at home. Um, because we are a one-stop shop, we have that breadth of businesses and, and three that can offset each other in good times in one area versus versus the next. So um, continuity and consistency is really important. And we're proud of the fact that we delivered not just Q3, but we still we still see strong momentum into Q4 and gave guidance for accelerating revenue growth to 49 to 55% year over year. Talk to us about the future of crypto on the platform. How many more cryptocurrencies do you want to add? And, and can you share what you're considering? Yeah, we started the year with five different coins on the platform. Uh, we've now expanded to over 30. We'll continue to add selection. And we have a very specific criteria of what um, qualifies to be an asset on the platform. Um, we're also looking at other things beyond uh, the assets that I mentioned and alternative asset classes uh, down the road. We want to give Main Street investors the access to investing vehicles that are similar to you know, high net wealth individuals. And the ability to deliver an IPO at IPO prices is quite unique. We think there's an opportunity to do that in other asset classes as well. All right, SoFi CEO, Anthony Noto, always good to have you here. And it's Veterans Day. I know you're a veteran, so thank you for your service and sharing time with us today. Thank you, thank you Emily. Take care. All right. Some other news we are following. Uber is raising its base fares in London by 10% to attract more drivers. Customers have complained on social media about longer wait times, cancellations, and higher fares, especially during peak hours. Uber says it needs about 20,000 more drivers in London to help get service to normal. And shares of Beyond Meat plunging the most in a year. The maker of plant-based meats releasing a disappointing sales projection for the next quarter. That sparked concern that the company's fast growth in recent years is starting to taper off. Coming up, 
The online education platform Masterclass has announced a range of new offerings ahead of the holidays. We're catching up with Masterclass CEO David Rogier. Next, this is Bloomberg. California drone startup Zipline will begin delivering medicine, blood, and other supplies to homes in Salt Lake City, Utah. The company's fixed-wing drones have been transporting medical supplies to rural clinics in Rwanda and Ghana since 2016. Zipline says it expects to make its first deliveries in the spring of 2022 and reach hundreds per day within four years of launching that service. Meantime, from the kitchen to the garden to the stage, Masterclass has an offering for just about anyone looking to develop new talents. A company that benefited from pandemic-induced shutdowns and a transition to digital media, now hoping to keep that momentum going with a slew of new offerings. They've got updated instructors and class announcements, and they're now working with companies. With me now to discuss these big announcements, Masterclass CEO David Rogier. David, great to have you back here on the show. It is great so to you've back. got new. You've got new classes on there or coming from Bill and Hillary Clinton, George W. and Laura Bush, Mariah Carey, Amanda Gorman, Bill Nye, Ringo Starr. You can pick one class. Which one do you spring for? Bill Nye. Bill Nye. I've Why? always the wanted to guy. be much better at. <laughs> I always wish I was much, bet, strong, much stronger at science, and he is an amazing teacher. So if, I, if I'm going to choose one of those, I like all, I like every single one of them. You're, ask, you're almost asking me to pick a kid, but if I was going to choose one to take right now, it would be Bill Nye. All right. Uh, meantime, you're partnering with companies like Microsoft and Deloitte to offer Masterclass at work. How much new business do you expect as a result of this? That has been very extre extremely fast growing. We we have seen over, over the past year as 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 companies try to find perks and training of their teams that they just want masterclass. So we in the past year have signed deals with ev with folks like with with fo with fo with folks like Square and Deloitte um, and the and that over for the next five years will become a major uh, stream for us. What has demand been like as we come out of COVID? We've got less time stuck at home for personal enrichment. Any concerns about a slowdown? I am not concerned. I think the demand for people to want to learn, to want to grow is just, it is just, is just increasing. Also, we are about to go into the hot in we 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 are about to go into the into the into the holidays. We are a gift that is not stuck in any port um, that is not delayed. So we, you know, I I I am thrilled um, and ex and ex and excited for the end of the year. And and what about demand ahead of the holidays? You know, I know that Masterclass has often been a popular gifting option. It has always been one. I think this end of this year, we, ha we have a class for everyone. Um, it is a great gift, and it's also one that, despite all the slowdowns in the supply chains, it, it is one that you can buy and get. Are you thinking at all about live events or events in virtual reality or, or even the metaverse? Is that on your radar? It, those are things that we are talking about. It's not. It is not. It is not going to be something in the short term. Um, but imagine how great it would. It could. It could be to learn from Steph Curry on how to shoot a basketball, and you use your phone to look in AR or in or in VR to see where to place your feet. Um, so those are things that we are discussing. But it's not going to be anything in the short term. Now it's not inexpensive, $180 for the base subscription. You, you go up to $276, something more for something more premium. Do you foresee a time when that cost will come down? You know, the cost, if you average out on a month on a per month basis, it starts about 
at about 15 bucks a month, which for access to 150, cla 150 classes from the very best in the world, I think is an amazing deal. But one of the things that I care a lot about is how to give people that can't afford it access to it. So in the next year, we are gonna give access to a million people that otherwise could not afford it. All right, now let's look, look out to next year. How do you see growth keeping up, picking up, especially as you know we're coming off our couches, we're going out into the world, we have so many different opportunities to do things outside again? That is very true, but I think the other trend that's also happening is pe people are thinking about changing jobs and changing and changing things that they want to actually do. And what we provide is lots of classes in lots of new areas for them to explore and learn and gain those skills. So I think the macro trends of people wanting to learn, people feel, feel, to feel that they have to learn in order to get the jobs that they want um, is going to be great for us. And what is the, well, who's at the top of your list for wish list recruits? Ooh, I mean, <laughs> I have a long list, but okay, the top ones, I would love uh, the Obamas to come and teach. Um, if Warren Buffett would come and teach, um, those would be some of my top, those would probably be uh, in my top five. All right, we'll try to get that message to them, David. Thank you, Emily. David I Rogier, CEO of Masterclass. Great to have you back here on the show. Thanks for stopping by. All right, coming up, Alibaba's shopping extravaganza. Singles Day posting a record $84.5 billion in sales. We're looking at what's different this year and how the competition stacks up. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Alibaba Singles Day is the world's biggest shopping spree, eclipsing other events like Cyber Monday and Black Friday. One of the biggest recent drivers of that growth has been live streaming influencers, some of whom have built massive followings and can move billions of dollars worth of goods in a single broadcast. Here's a look at the growth and the future of e-com live streams. Meet China's most popular retail influencers, Via and Austin Li Jiaqi. These two have such big followings that Lee once sold 15,000 units of lipstick in just five minutes. Together, they racked up sales last year of $8.2 billion. That's made Via a multi-millionaire at age 36, with one of her broadcasts pulling in a record high audience of 37 million people. That's more than the Game of Thrones finale or the Oscars. Across mainland China, online streams raked in revenue of about 149 billion last year. That's just under 1 trillion yuan. That represented about 10% of China's annual online retail sales of just under 10 trillion yuan in 2020. Astronomical growth, really, for an industry that Alibaba pioneered as a marketing tool just five years ago. A survey last year found that almost 40% of all Chinese internet users had watched e-commerce live streams. 28,000 companies now operate as live streaming agencies, growing so successful in some cases that several are said to be considering going public. But all this capital flowing into these influencer incubators has drawn increased scrutiny from Beijing. In April, regulators set new rules controlling the types of goods and services sold and how they're marketed towards viewers. They also cracked down on fraud, with several influencers and agencies accused of selling fake products and inflating sales figures, earning them fines and bans from using streaming platforms. But the biggest impact could come from regulations linked to Beijing's common prosperity drive. As part of the initiative to reshape Chinese society, Authorities have cracked down on the culture of celebrity, putting at risk one of the key pillars of the industry's success. For now, it's business as usual, but Bloomberg Intelligence says that any potential fallout can't be quantified until regulations are clarified.
Singles Day posting a record $84.5 billion in sales and could serve as an indication about what holiday shopping looks like this season globally. Joining us for more, Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Stephen, what's your big takeaway? That's a big number. Hi. It is a big number, and there was a lot of uncertainty this year because of the regulatory scrutiny, obviously, that Alibaba has been under for the last uh, year. And, uh, you know, Jack Ma's a showman, but he has been off the stage, out of the public eye for uh, the better part of this year. And we really didn't know, you know, what impact that would have because you and I have covered Singles Day together. I think about six years ago, we were in Beijing together covering it. It is quite a show, you know, Taylor Swift and all the celebrity. Uh, this year, they, they, took the high gloss out a little bit and went more low key. They did not necessarily want to have that big electronic telethon like tally of gross merchandise value racking up every second billions and billions and billions of dollars. And oh, look, Jack Ma's getting even more rich, uh, more influential, more powerful. So they kind of did away with that and focused more on promoting uh, some philanthropic uh, endeavors and aid to the rural and the poor. Uh, and there's going to be actually a lot of costs associated with that according to Bloomberg Intelligence. But less glitz, glitz and glamour, uh, no offense to Benedict Cumberbatch, who was a celebrity there this year, but, you know, he's no Daniel Craig, right? So, you know, they, they, they toned it down a little bit. No Nicole Kidman, no Daniel Craig, no Taylor Swift, but again, a big shopping number. It's a big shot in the arm for Alibaba, big shot in the arm for confidence in the consumer in China. Talk to us about the role of influencers, you know, even if Benedict Cumberbatch isn't quite Daniel Craig and, you know, influencers <laughs> in the future of e-commerce, where it seems to be even more advanced in China than in other parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, KOLs, key opinion leaders, are critical uh, in Chinese uh, internet. Uh, and now, as we just saw in that package, uh, uh, you know, schlocking product. Uh, but again, it comes at a time of common prosperity. And, you know, this, this notion of celebrity has been kind of uh, knocked down a peg a little bit by uh, some, some verbiage coming from Beijing authorities. So it's a delicate balance, for sure. But as we can see, uh, when you get a key opinion leader, a celebrity schlocking, Talking toothpaste or lip gloss or whatever, it pushes product. Uh, not that we didn't need to have, uh, you know, more, you know, incentive to buy products because look at that big record number on Singles Day. But again, it adds to the uh, the sales numbers. Meantime, Chinese tech stocks killing it right now. Didi as well relaunching its apps. Curious what you make of this, given. All of the scrutiny from Beijing on, you know, not just Alibaba, but Didi and so many Chinese tech companies. Look, there's been a confluence of headwinds, uh, regulatory and economic, and uh, due to the coronavirus in the Chinese economy, uh, and all coming kind of at once. So there's been cr regulatory crackdowns, not only on big tech, but on insurance, obviously uh, fintech, obviously on gaming, obviously on property, at a time when Xi Jinping as well just solidified his power base, his mandate at the plenum. Uh, this was a highly charged political year in China, and he was solidifying his grip on that power and his control of what he thought was an out-of-control economy to, in certain areas. Monopolistic behavior on the part of Alibaba, uh, some fines against them. Didi is an interesting one as well because authorities were absolutely furious when Didi uh, kind of ignored uh, recommendations, if you want to call it that, from authorities and went ahead with that IPO in June in New York uh, and did not necessarily have all the cybersecurity reviews necessary. Uh, they had their apps taken down from, uh, you know, China. And there's a new report, and that's why now that the plenum is over and the relaxation in property, relaxation a little bit here and there, there's a report from Reuters, at least, saying that uh, Didi might be getting their apps back up online in China by the end of the year. They could be facing a big fine, like Alibaba did, but again, getting those apps back up online is why there's a big boost to Didi's sentiment right now. All right, Stephen Engel joining us on this very early morning in Hong Kong. Stephen, always good to have you. Thank you for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow when we're going to be joined by Open Doors CFO Carrie Wheeler, also the CEO of Amplitude, and Spencer Skates, as well as the CEO of Airtable. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.